And I am Daphna Michelson Janae, and I am your state representative for Colorado's House District 30. Welcome to the eighth town hall in our summer town hall series. Although you could have been surprised when you thought it was summer, but it turned into winter. I don't know. These are things that happen in Colorado. Um, but today we're talking about something very important and very near and dear to my heart. We're going to talk about annual mental health wellness exams and the request for information that has been recently released to the public. So I'm going to let my two presenters introduce themselves. I'll start with Felisa Dodd and then we'll go over to Commissioner Conway. Felisa, please introduce yourself, who you're with, and um, a little bit about why you're here today. Oh, hi. My name is uh, Felicity Dodd Fraser. I am a licensed clinical social worker for the state of Colorado. I am a board member for the NASW, which is National Association of Social Workers for the state of Colorado. And I am the past board president, just recently past board president. And this is important to me because um, I believe that preventative medicine is better than reactive medicine. And if we can normalize mental health services for anybody, that we could probably head off some issues that, you know, if they weren't addressed um, could be, you know, set to the side or uh, addressed and, and have people cope a little better, particularly kids. I work with a lot of kids and I feel like if we can get it, get them earlier than later, sooner than later, that we, we would have more success personally, academically, and just across the board. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here. And Commissioner Conway, on a Sunday, um, thank you so much. If you could introduce yourself, tell the public a little bit about your office and what your office does as well, please. Sure. So hello, everybody. Mike Conway, the uh, insurance commissioner for the state of Colorado. So uh, at the Division of Insurance, we regulate all things insurance. We end up spending a significant amount of our time on health insurance, but we, we touch it all. So we do everything from homeowners insurance to your car insurance to the commercial lines of insurance, so things like business interruption insurance all the way to things like bail bonds um, and regulating both the bail bond agents and then the companies that actually sell those products as well. So we regulate the insurance companies and also the insurance agents that, that sell the, the policies to the general public. So I'm very happy to be here, Representative. I won't bore folks with a, a long kind of litany of, of who I am. We'll just get right into it. All right. So <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about House Bill 1086, which was a bill that we had in the legislature last year with the goal to require insurance companies to cover an annual mental health wellness exam in the same way that an annual physical is covered, which means as preventative care and with no copay. And um, the basis for this bill for me is that in 2008, the federal government passed a law called MAPIA, which is the Mental Health Parity Addiction Equity Act. Whew, it's a mouthful. But ultimately, what it says is that where you have physical health benefits, you should have equivalent mental health benefits and behavioral health benefits. So what does that look like? And since 2008, I would say that the states have been trying to figure that out and come up with a way to make the benefits equivalent, but I don't think we've gotten there yet. And what I'm presenting to the public is that I believe that we are due annual mental health wellness exams, that they are a part of our parity promise from 2008, and I'm trying to bring it forward in our state so that in Colorado, we can have what I believe will look like true parity. So I brought Felicidad on because one of the key focuses of the bill is this annual mental health wellness exam, which for me is about having the right level of care at the right place at the right time. And I believe social workers are an excellent first line of defense for your mental health. Felicia Dodd, can you talk about why the social workers got behind House Bill 1086? And what do you think an annual mental health wellness exam would look like and could um, accomplish? Uh, one of the, the biggest reasons um, I'm behind this, and, and I believe all social workers that I've dealt with are behind it, is again, is the preventative work, is that we've seen a lot of, um, and I work specifically with kids, but people in general, who are kind of lost um, with how to get help when they feel mentally unwell. 
um, there's a there's a huge stigma around uh, getting help and looking for help and not sure where to go and how to how to go about it. Um, I personally believe that social workers are um, fit for fit for the job or fit for duty for it. Um, not only because I'm a social worker and I am biased uh, in favor of social workers, but I believe the training is a little more well-rounded. Um, I believe uh, a lot of a lot of what we do is person-centered, person and environment. Um, and, and the person is the, is, the, is the root of everything. And we look at all the externals that affect a person's life and a person's decision that would offset or um, accentuate mental health for, for folks. Um, a, a lot of it has to do with, I don't know, for, for me as a social worker, when I'm working with someone, I, I, I look at where that person is, why, why they are the way they are, and what can we do to offset any of the negativity. Um, what would that assessment look like? It would be an assessment, kind of like when you go to the dentist's office and have you had any changes in the last year? Have you, have you noticed any differences? Um, are you feeling more down lately, especially during the, the, the COVID time? I, I noticed a lot more people are feeling this anxiety or this depression, they can't put a finger on it. Um, but a, a lot of people are, are excusing it or passing it off which, you know, kind of like a festering sore, if you don't address it, it, it can get worse. And, and it, it's simple as having a conversation, or maybe they don't realize that they're so upset or so encroached in all this stuff that's going on, and we can, we can take it apart. Does it mean that someone has to go into therapy after they have an assessment? No, uh, we can offer that recommendation, but kind of like with a regular exam, you know, to get your blood work. Get, get your eyes checked, get your get everything checked. Well, get your mind checked, get your heart checked. And, and, uh, and I don't mean literal heart, but your, your spiritual heart checked to make sure that it's all in play because mind and body, the, the one doesn't work without the other. And that, that I mean, in a huge nutshell, is, it would be beneficial to so many. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Commissioner Conway, you have been a partner in trying to help me figure this out. And um, we are going to bring this bill back, hopefully this year. And you, your office has recently RFI. Can you explain to us what an RFI is and what the thought process is behind this? Sure. Thanks, Representative. And I'll apologize uh, at the front end. And if you hear a two-year-old destroying my house, I, I am at home. So that may come through in the background um, because he's downstairs currently destroying the house. Um, so the, the RFI is a request for information. Um, so the, where that came from, I think as we, as you and I have had many conversations, Representative, the, the governor in particular was a little bit surprised this year with the number of quote unquote mandate bills that came through um, last legislative session. So as part of trying to figure out a way for the legislature to really evaluate those, the mandates, he wanted to come up with a, a framework of some kind to help folks just understand what is going on with whatever the bills may be that come down the pike. Um, so we put together this process, hopefully is a kind of a beginning framework that the legislature would be able to pick up and, uh, and run with if they, if they deem so, if they deem that to be a good idea. And the, but the basic idea here is that we want to get information from anybody and everybody about this bill, your bill 1086 representative, and then also Representative Kennedy's bill um, from last se session on opioids. Um, but to evaluate what the costs are, um, the potential costs are gonna be the increase in costs. Um, and really what we're talking about primarily is premium costs, but there could be increase in, in deductibles and co-payments that would be important to be looking at. What the benefits are too, um, so what the benefits are gonna be for both on the cost side, the long-term benefits for costs, if there are gonna, if there are potentially any long-term benefit on cost savings, um, and then also, obviously, to, to Felicity Dodd's points, the, the long-term benefits for just Coloradans in general. Um, and then the third category really is kind of a, it, it's, it gets a little bit into the weeds, so I'll keep it high level, but the third category that we're really interested in is going back to that cost part of the equation. There was kind of a quirk um, that was written into the Affordable Care Act that any new mandates um, that are written into state law after 2012 the state has to actually pay for the increase in premiums itself that, that in Colorado, Coloradans actually have. 
um, it, they, they did that at the federal, they made that part of the framework of the ACA because there was a concern that if they didn't, um, that states would, uh, would end up including a bunch of new mandates in their state law that then the federal government would have to pay for. So we're very obviously concerned about the economic situation, the fiscal situation that we find ourselves in because of COVID and um, other issues that are, that are impacting us with COVID. Um, so we need to make sure that we're evaluating that piece of this too, to make sure that if there are any cost increases, that we have the ability to make arguments um, like you and I have talked about, Representative, that you actually touched on at the beginning here, that this isn't necessarily a new mandate, but what are the other arguments that we can make? So is this something that really is required by the parity law, by mental health parity, by MAPIA, that was passed in 2008 and then really kind of went into full force in 2014 when the ACA kicked in. So that's the, the basic framework for the RFI. Um, it's open until the end of this month. So we're, we're keeping, we're asking for information through September 30th. And then uh, we're gonna have a hearing, or not a hearing, but we're gonna have a public meeting on October 21st to really discuss what we heard, what we got um, in that RFI, what we heard from folks, and just kind of evaluate where we are. And then we're gonna issue a report um, to, to the legislature and to the governor about what we saw on the RFI and what we think the actual impacts are. And who are the people who would be responding to the RFI? Anybody and everybody. Um, we're anticipating, I would, I, I'm anticipating that the insurance companies will likely be responding. Um, I would hope that we'll get some advocate groups that will be responding as well. Um, but it's anybody and everybody that wants to give us information uh, about whether, whether it's your bill representative or, or representative Kennedy's. Um, we want to hear from anybody that wants to, to come into that process. And where do you submit their request, their um, response to your request? So it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say it a couple times probably today so everybody gets it. It's Dora. E-O-R-A underscore I-N-S underscore rules and records at state.co.us. So I'll, I'll say that first part again, just so folks have it. It's Dora, D-O-R-A underscore I-N-S underscore rules and records at state.co.us. Uh, but we can make sure that we get that to you to representative so that folks can find it on your, uh, on your website. And if you can pop that into the, I'm not sure why I'm hearing an echo every time I speak. Um, if you can drop that into the chat, uh, that sure. would be awesome. And then um, our our wonderful staff can put it on the Facebook as well. Khaleesi Dad, when you hear about a request for information like that, is this something that you or social workers have responded to in the past? Um, or And how would you go about getting people to respond? And who do you feeling in your core group is, are the right people to be responding? Uh, absolutely, thank you, Representative. Absolutely, this is definitely something that we would respond to um, as an organization, NESW, and personally. Um, and we get the information out through Facebook. There's a whole lot of social work groups that I'm on, and the, the main one that, that um, was worked with the University of Denver Students Class of 2010 is the GSSW Friends and Resources page. Um, there's a Denver Therapy Connection page, there's all kinds of pages, and um, when I'm talking to uh, clients, parents of clients of mine that come in, I talk to them about Bill 1086 often, um, just as uh, more as casual conversation, because a lot of them didn't even know that um, it, it had passed, um, and so it, it keeping, keeping everyone informed. Um, Anybody and everybody that, because it's gonna affect anybody and everybody. It, it, once we have some clarity on it all, um, it, it, we can get the push behind it all. Knowledge is power. And so stuff like this, I, I keep people informed on the regular almost daily, <laughs> almost daily, so. Well, I appreciate you keeping people informed. Commissioner Conway, when you're um, receiving this information, what is the, what is the um, formal way that somebody should be responding? Is there a specific form of letter? Is there um, a link that you're looking for? Is there specific information that you're looking for? How can we help the public understand how they can partake in responding? Yeah, so in the request for information itself that we've got posted up on our website, um, and I, I can get the, the link to that to you all as well. Um, there's nine different categories of information that we that we break it down into. Some of it is it gets a little bit kind of technical, but really it's those it's the the two main buckets that I think 
the vast majority of the public will, will be interested in responding to is what they think um, what they think the costs and the benefits are from 1086 or a bill like 1086. And that's really what we're what we're trying to get down to the nitty gritty of some of the more detailed information. I think um, some some folks will be interested in delving into uh, and getting us information if they have access to that information. And we would love to see any any of that kind of information along the costs and the benefits as, as you get into things like utilization and, and other issues that really get pretty far down into the weeds. But for the general public that that wants to engage in this, I really think it's a it's a basic understanding and arguments as to what they think the costs and benefits are. And are there certain things that you're looking for when you um, analyze this data, like at the end when you're preparing your report? So I think we'll be looking at the if if folks have actuarial evidence that they submit. Um, like I know, Representative, you 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 went down that path. Of putting things together along those uh, that detailed information, anything like that will be helpful. Um, the long-term benefits that folks like Felicity Dad would be able to argue to, um, I think, will be helpful as well. And then I'm sure that the insurance companies will have a fair amount of information for us about what they think the the long-term and the short-term costs are for um, for 1086. So one more question for you, Commissioner, or another question for you. Um, you mentioned that, and I mentioned the Federal um, Parity Act, MAPIA. What would it look like if the federal government came back and said, okay, Colorado, this is a new mandate? What, what could it cost us? How do we put that into dollars and cents? So that's a key part of the, the equation, um, Representative. So uh, we would have to pay for any increase in premiums that the that the bill would cause. So the reason why that's the case um, is the the especially in the individual market or primarily in the individual market, the federal government the, the tax credits that they the, the subsidies that they provide to consumers are it's all based on the amount of premium and then also the the income level that folks have. But as premiums go up, the federal government pays out more in subsidies. So part of what they were trying to accomplish with this, this provision in the Affordable Care Act was to, uh, to protect the federal government's coffers from being ha having to pay increased subsidies because states are passing more mandates. So the actual dollar amount representative, I don't know at this point, this, that's, the, that's the actuarial work that I think will, would, would be really important for any new mandate. And that's what, when I said, when we, uh, when we put together this framework, it's, it's just a framework that I think we need to grow from as far as evaluation of mandates. We didn't have the money or the time um, to really do the actuarial work um, that would be part of answering that question here. But over the next six months, we'll have to do that if, if the, as this bill moves forward. So there's no way to say something like if it was a dollar a person, it would cost X for the state? So it would be, so there's about 225,000 people to 275,000 people that are in the individual market. Okay. So if it was a dollar per person, you can do the math relatively easily. And that, but it, then it would grow exponentially, obviously, depending on, on what the actuarial math really would show us. Okay. Felicidad, this is a question that um, probably isn't fair to ask. Um, when we're talking about the dollars and cents, we know that there is a cost associated with things like suicide. Um, and I think ultimately what we'll have to show is the, the costs outweigh um, not, doing, not, not doing this. But when you think about an annual exam, somebody coming to be checked up annually to check in with their social worker, do you think it could have impact on suicidality? Uh, no question. No question. Uh, just uh, as a school social worker, so like I see my kids nine months out the year, we have that break, they come back and, and I get to see them again. Um, we do see some regression, not only academically, but sometimes socially, particularly in the school that I'm, that I'm working in. Um, a lot of times, the, it, it, again, it's mostly kids, but we adults are gigantic kids, I think, sometimes. Um, and I find that 
a, a lot of kids, if they had that moment of intervention, that moment of someone reaching out, that, that moment of anything that, that we offset, I, I can't promise you that it, it would prevent suicide um, because that's always an option for some with no judgment whatsoever. Um, but I feel like if, if kids have that moment or that place where they, can, they know that they can go to, um, that we can offset some of those feelings, if not help them cope through them and, and they become part of the past at all. So when I start hearing dollars and cents, while well, I understand you know, that there's a cost to it all, my, my heart is going, but these are kids, these are people. You know, we shouldn't have to put price on, on, on the help for people with the understanding that you know, everything has a cost to it and, and that we have to have, you know, weigh in on all of that. Do, do I think it's the best thing that we can do? No more than, you know, pre-diabetic care, no more than that, thing, that finger prick, right? It's a, it's a little finger prick, but man, it means a whole lot to me in the course of the day. Um, that one conversation that somebody can have with, with a professional who is willing to reach out their hand and say, I got you, I can walk with you, so that they don't get to that point of despair is is priceless. So. I I agree, and I'm I'm that I'm that bleeding heart, and I'm I'm I've cried this to Commissioner Conway ten million times, seven ways from Sunday. Um, I don't know where that that phrase comes from, but I'm gonna have it to look it up. <laughs> or twice on Sundays, and that's the other one that you hear that should, it's just on. Yeah, right? twice on Sunday. Okay, um, right. but here we are on a Sunday, yes. and. I guess the question is, Commissioner, obviously we can't guarantee that all of a sudden our suicide rate is going to plummet, right? Um, is that my dream and ultimate desire? Absolutely, 100%. But just like we can't stop heart disease because people are going to their um, annual physicals, but we can stop or push off that heart attack because we can give the right kind of medication, are we able to make those kinds of correlations and do they, do they count? Yeah, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's important to, to, to also include as part of this conversation some of the good work that, that the state has done over the past couple of years uh, because I think it's, it's vital so to, um, to make sure that we're, we're considering that in, in everything that we're doing. So, um, taking a step back. So MAPIA passed in 2008. It didn't really apply to the vast majority of um, our big chunks of the health insurance markets until 2014 when the ACA went fully into effect. But there was also a component of it that MAPIA was left to the states to enforce, but the federal government didn't give us any resources to do that. So it's been a struggle as a result of that for the, for the first three to four years uh, after it went into full effect in the ACA. But because of House Bill 1269 a few years ago, which Representative Janae, you know, you know quite a bit about, that bill gave us resources, um, specific resources at the Division of Insurance to get out there and enforce both MAPIA, the federal MAPIA law, but also state provisions that we've been able to put into place here. And because of that, we've been able to hire care achievers onto our team, which I'm sure some of us she might be listening now and you know very well. She's a rock star and an all star, and she's doing great work to actually get into the healthcare plans and make sure that mental health parity is being um, enforced and that they're complying with the law across the board. And I think we're gonna start to see dividends paid from that um, over the next six to 12 months. But there's also the behavioral health task force that the governor ordered and that the governor put together um, that we've been working on over the last year. And to, to Felicity Dodd's exact point, right? We just got through with two huge recommendations coming out of that behavioral health task force. One, to set up a behavioral health administration um, so that that behavioral health administration has the ability to really make sure that we, we do have a complete and full ecosystem that is acting appropriately for behavioral health care. But there's also then a care coordination component, right? So the, the, the task force just voted um, to require as part of that behavioral health administration for care coordination to be a core, core component of whatever we're doing as we march forward with behavioral health care. Um, and that's exactly where Felicity Dad was going with that, with the, with the kids and the students where we don't want to lose them for that three months, that six months. And it's going to be incredibly important to make sure that we have the private insurance market that is walking hand in glove or hand in hand 
um, with the with both the the behavioral health side of CDHS and with Medicaid, and that's what this framework is going to allow us to set up and and put into the market so that we really do have a more cohesive marketplace when it comes to behavioral health care. Um, but I, I think that as far as where we go next and what what happens with this piece of the conversation, I think it's absolutely a core component of it, Representative, that we that we make sure that we are answering those exact questions through this RFI and through the conversation going into the next session. Excellent. Um, I don't know if we have any questions in the Facebook chat, but if we do, if my team could put them in the chat for me, I would appreciate it. Um, any questions that you might have for Commissioner Conway or for Felicidad? Um, Felicidad, in your population with your students, you talked about how they might benefit from uh, care like this. How would you see it coordinated with school? Or would you see it coordinated with school? So, um, oh. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, if, if, if I had my druthers, um, just haven't experienced it over the last few years, um, like I have, I have one kiddo that comes to mind um, you know, and this is out of the IEP hours and everything else that I spent a lot of time with, a lot of hours with at night, and you know, that two o'clock in the morning question of, well, what about this? And I feel this way. Um, and then when school ended, I had to, I had to separate, you know, just to maintain the boundary. Um, and I think there should be like a gap service. So when school ends, where do these kids go? between, you know, in Colorado ends at May and starts again in August, between May and August, where do the kids go? And we can always say, oh, well, there's the, 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 the 24 hour line, which is awesome. There's the walking clinics, which are awesome. Um, but a, a lot of the kids have that social anxiety about starting with somebody new. Um, and if we could just, again, bridge that gap between school year and summer and, and, and let them know that they have somebody that they're familiar with, a preferred adult, or, or somebody or something where they feel safe, where they can continue to have that care. So when they come back and come back to school, specific to school, that they they would they would support. It's it's kind of like you know eating a buffet all day long and then starving for for a summer and then going back to the buffet. You know you, you overwhelm the, the the body with with that food while you're overwhelming. The, the, the kids have three months to, you know, stew in their own juices without knowing exactly where to go, knowing that there's supports in place, there are things in place for them, but if we can have something that's familiar to them, then they probably be, would be a little more, um, a little more adjusted uh, to not only coming back to school, but socializing and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Can I ask, can I ask a question, rep Representative, related to that? Sure. So, Felicia, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, um, so I think one of maybe the only silver linings to COVID is is the virtual aspect of it, right? Um, obviously, yes, that's yes. not true for everybody, and we have we have huge gaps that we still have to figure out ways to fill. But do you do you think? And I think it's it's probably too early to maybe know the complete answer to this question. But do you think that because we have now um, all grown accustomed to being virtual um, and to using things like Zoom um, for all sorts of different things? Do you think that that provides an avenue for us to kind of fill that summer gap that you're talking about maybe in the future? Absolutely, absolutely, sir. Sorry, I have an echo. Um, absolutely, I can tell you that prior, prior to COVID, I, I, for, for my own kids, and, and I'm not talking about just the school kids, I mean, any kid I've come in contact with, I've, I've pretty much made myself available 24 seven. And a, a lot of kids, and it's exhausting, and I understand that, but I, I think it's less exhausting for me than it is for the kid that's reaching out. And so they had access to me on phone, they could text, not phone calls, because at three o'clock in the morning phone call was a, a bit much, but a text message, an email, uh, a, 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 a Facebook message, you know, on the, on the page that, that I set up for them. And so that worked um, with the kids that I was with. The, the Zoom thing is wonderful because now I can jump on. Okay, you're having an issue now. I have 15 minutes I can give you now, or 30 minutes. It's preventative. So that kid, instead of stewing and stewing, and where can I go and how can I turn, they know that they can, with a click of a button, they can come on and, you know, 90% of the time, which is not a scientific number, but 
of, of, of my kids, 90% of the time, once they've talked through it, they realize, oh, it wasn't that big. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, and, and let me give you a side note. There was a, a, another kiddo I was working with was working with that one kiddo, the sibling of the kiddo, would, you know, I had only heard about the sibling, um, never really talked to him at all. And the sibling reached out to me and didn't, the family didn't know that the sibling was suicidal. And, and the, the kiddo was talking to me and we worked through it. That to me is the crux of the, a, a, an assessment because no one knew that this kid was struggling until this kid heard me talking to the sibling. And then they finally came through and that kid was doing awesome now. And, you know, they know that a text message away, a Zoom call away, you know, just, just availability. I, I wish that we could do this all the time. Yeah, you know, and I, I uh, the other thing that I think that um, I've even seen it in my own family, that it, that it absolutely helps to address is the stigma aspect, right? It's, it's much easier to, for that click and to get over the stigma with that click than it is to walk into a physical building or go even to the physical building. I mean, first you got to get the person to go there then they've got to walk in. Both of those things are huge roadblocks for the state because of stigma and just all sorts of other issues. But the, the ability, at, at least I hope, the ability that, that we are now really putting into the market to make it a click away, um, I, I really do hope can help with that problem too. And if I can add anything, sorry, I have echo. Um, just, just normalizing not being okay. It is okay to not be okay and it's okay to need help, and it's okay to get help. There's, there's not one person on the face of the earth that can't say that they haven't reached out or wanted to reach out or needed to reach out at some point. And if we can make it as simple as, hey, I'm going to get my shots today. Hey, I'm going to get my teeth cleaned next week. If, if we can add that to the routine, then we, the, the stigma goes away on its own. Um, Commissioner, you spoke about care coordination. And one of the things that I think about in care coordination is coordinating the mental health and the physical health um, together. How, how are you working? How is the state working on care coordination? How do we um, give uh, doctors the, the push to make sure that they have a social worker or other mental health professional within their practice? So uh, Medicaid has done a ton of work over the last three or four years, um, really get, getting integrating um, and getting to, to, to the point of what you're talking about, Representative, but I, I would, uh, I'd obviously let Kim talk to that instead of me. But as far as what you're, where you're going with the, um, with the primary care offices in particular, right, to make sure or to incentivize, I'll say it that way, to incentivize primary care offices to have social workers um, and behavioral health care workers just in general as part of that um, suite of services that are available to folks. We have another bill that passed over the last couple of years. The, there was a primary care bill that passed um, two years ago that uh, did a, a few different things. But one of the things that were probably the most important piece of it was that it's going to require the, the insurance companies to increase the, the percentage of the premium dollar that is going to primary care. Um, and the intent is to really kind of do exactly what we've talked about um, for the last half hour, 45 minutes or so, to really get to the point where we're providing more services, more preventative care for folks, um, and to make it so that we're spending that premium dollar more efficiently and more effectively. I think it's really the, the most important part. But because of that, because they're going to be, because we're going to be requiring insurance companies to get more of that premium dollar to primary care offices, where our hope and our push will be to use those, to use that increased um, increased funding to do things like that. So, to, so that we have primary care offices that have the ability and the, the services available to consumers to do exactly what we've been talking about. Yeah, I think the scenario that the uh, primary care docs have, uh, that every primary care office have a uh, social work team as part of their staff. And so when you come in for care, they can ask the question, are you going for your annual mental health wellness exam? Have you been taking care of your mental health? And or make a uh, quick introduction to um, somebody who would be covered on their insurance. Yeah, and I mean, I think even taking it a step back, what we, what we spent a lot of time talking about with the, with the task force, 
was that we want people when when that person calls when the person that's in crisis or just in general is calling for information about behavioral health care the care coordination that we really talked about there was that that person that gets the phone call has the ability to connect them to whether it's whether it's state services if they're a medicaid or a medicare um, patient or it's the private market that they then they can they connect them to the private the right services within the private market as well but then that person also has the ability to get them to the, the, the Colorado that's in need to other services that might be available to them, whether it's housing, whether it's food assistance, whatever it might be. Um, and then that person can kind of be the core structure that that, that, the, that Colorado that reached out can consistently go back to and make sure that they're actually getting the correct information and they have kind of a one place, one place to go instead of having to go to 20 different places to get a bunch of different information. So that's really the care coordination that I was talking about, and that's the, the long-term goal. Um, but that's going to take that that'll take a few years to get up and running. But that's the vision, um, and the vision is a really important piece of making sure that we get there. That's it. Um, we also have the Office of the Behavioral Healthcare Ombudsman, and I'm just wondering, do they um, in, interact with your office at all? They do. Um, so I actually stole the, the first behavioral health care ombudsman to come over and be my chief deputy of life and health, Kate Harris. Um, so in that sense, yes, they absolutely do interact with us, but also just from a general sense, um, they, they get complaints into that office. Um, and then if it is, if it's the private market that the complaint uh, is connected to, they feed that information to us and we can run with it. But then they also just, they're, they're a resource for us as well. To really get a feel for what is happening in the marketplace. Um, one of the things that we do, one of the many things that we do at the Division of Insurance is we, we also, we do essentially what, what are called examinations, but they're really just audits of insurance complaints. Um, and we have audits going on right now, um, looking at how companies are or are not complying with parity. Um, and the information that we get from the Ombudsman Office can really help us uh, kind of structure and, and look at the companies that we think that we need to look at. Wonderful. Okay, so I that was one of my bills. So I just wanted to make sure that was a pop quiz to um, make sure that the Office of the Behavioral Healthcare Ombudsman is uh, out there serving the people and um, getting a, a positive recommendation. It sounds like from the uh, division or from the Office of Insurance. Yes, absolutely. So, um, we're going to close off now, and what I'd like to hear from each of you are some tips that you might have for a person who wants to respond to this request for information or any final words or thoughts you have on, on annual mental health wellness exams. And we'll start with Felicia Dodd. Um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If I can, if, if, if we can touch one person preventatively, we've touched six degrees of separation of all of their lives. And you, you can't get better than that. Um, and they can always, if they want information, I, my email, I'll gladly throw it out there. Um, they can ask me and, and I, I, if I don't know it, I know who to go to to ask. <laughs> Wonderful. Commissioner? So as far as the, the RFI is concerned, um, please don't be shy. Get us any and all information that, that folks think would be helpful for us to, to really look at the, those costs and the benefits. Um, I think it's absolutely the case that this is all about access, right? What, we're ta what, we, what we've talked about all day today was um, making sure that people have access to healthcare. And that's been the push from this administration from the very get-go. We talk a lot about it as if it's... Um, about affordability, but affordability means access. That's what we're trying to get to and making sure that we have the right access for folks. Um, so we are very absolutely committed to that at the, at the DOI. We're gonna continue to push to make sure that the, the parity law is fully being complied with um, both at the state level and then as much as we can um, also advocate for any changes that we think that need to happen at the federal level. So we're really excited to see what we get um, at, as part of this RFI. Again, the, the just to repeat the date, October 21st, it's gonna be at nine o'clock. We, ha we haven't set up whether it's gonna be a Zoom um, webinar or some other platform, it will be virtual. But that public meeting, um, anybody will be able to come and talk to us uh, and tell us what they think about uh, House Bill 1086. Uh, so we hope to see everybody there. 
Thank you so much, both of you, for giving your time on a Sunday afternoon for this very important topic. If you're watching and you care about annual mental health wellness exams or have any information either way on, on um, whether or not this is a good idea, um, please do send an email to Dora underscore INS underscore, underscore rules and records at state.co.us. That is a mouthful. As I said. told you it was. <laughs> Um, but we'd love to hear from you. And I have the um, I have the call. So if you are looking for the RFI, so you can follow along with the directions that are are submitted to us, um, please do reach out to our office. Thank you so much for spending a Sunday afternoon with us. Take care, everyone. Thank you.